Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. And we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, test number one from Vault Comics, writer Christopher Sabella, artist Jen Hickman, um, letterer Hassan Othman El Howe, and colorist Harry Saxon. A fantastic creative team and a very dense and highly engaging book. It's got a hard sci-fi edge to it. It's got a great narrative flow with a refined use of language. The art is gritty and it's edgy. And compared to the cleaner style in books like Moth and Whisper from the artist Jen Hickman, it's, it's very different and they've really changed their style. It's definitely got a more gritty approach to it, but it's got excellent composition as well. It is absolutely fantastic. The lettering, the coloring, everything works in a pitch perfect manner to make this an exceptionally cool comic book, right? Absolutely fantastic stuff. I did an advanced review for this one, so if you want a little bit more of my thoughts, definitely check out that video. But test number one, another debut comic from Vault Comics that's just awesome. It's out there, it's innovative, it's unique, it's different, it has a different perspective than you're used to, and that's what I love. Books that are challenging and, and books that are forcing me to that are, that, are, that are leading me to look at things from different perspectives. Test is a fantastic book. The basic premise is that the main character, um, they are a professional guinea pig, basically, right? And they've become addicted to self-surgery and adding uh, futuristic technology into themselves and stuff like that, right? And they hear about this mythical place called Laurelwood, which is a small town in the middle of America where they're test marketing the future. And just going there could solve all of their problems, right? So it's a mythical type quest with a really hard sci-fi edge and some really gritty social commentary in there as well, talking about um, corporations and the way that they can test market things in now in the open through social media. How much longer until they get inside of your minds, inside of your body, inside of your life? 100%, right? Test number one is a fantastic book with a chilling view of the not too near future, but it also is incredibly engaging with interesting characters and a very compelling mystery. Test number one from Vault Comics, and if you needed another reason to pick up the book, we got the Vault Vintage line returning once again with an homage to Transmetropolitan number one, the cover to issue number one of the series by Derek Robertson and Warren Ellis. And this is definitely in the line of something like Transmet, so it's really appropriate that they pick that one. That's the pick of the week right there. The vault doesn't stop. She said Destroy number two is out this week. I really like this issue. I thought it probably was even more of an improvement um, on issue number one. It really keeps that pace going, keeps it knocking out alive. I really love the story set by Joe Corallo. Um, Liana Kangas does a great job with a loose and free um, line work style, but it really gets elevated and heightened by these colors by Nalty. Absolutely fantastic stuff. You had an Uji Mori on the lettering. I did an advanced review of this one as well, so if you want a little bit more of my thoughts, check out that video. She said Destroyed, though, was very bright, dazzling, vibrant, full of kinetic energy and life. I absolutely love this book. It's a very dynamic, um, fun, creative team, and they're making a very dynamic, fun, creative book, and I love it. She said Destroy is kind of like Star Wars um, with mythology thrown into it. Really love it. She said Destroy number two is out that week, and the artist of that book is Liana Kangas. She has another book out this week, Black AF Devil's Die number four. This is the final issue. This is written by Vita um, Ayala, which I really, really, really like their work, and I think they do fantastic stuff. So I've got all four issues of this. I'm going to be rereading this one soon. Rereading be reading it soon for the first time. Anyway, Black AF, Devil's Die, number four out this week. Also from Vault, The Return of Heathen. Heathen number seven is here. I just recently read issues one, two, three, and four. Hadn't read five or six, so I didn't obviously read issue number seven. That would be a little weird, right? But I did want to point out that it's back. It's going to continue on now on a like monthly basis. The second trade's coming out soon. We'll probably start covering it here. But those first four issues that I read, which are collected in the first trade paperback, are excellent, really cool stuff. Fans of Viking mythology and lore definitely want to check this one out. Um, I'll throw a link down below to get a trade paperback, help support PCP, help support Vault. Really good stuff. Heathen returns this week. From DC Comics, Lois Lane number one. The best thing about Brian Michael Bendis' Superman tenure so far has been this book and the upcoming Jimmy Olsen book by Matt Fraction. Greg Rucka writing a Lois Lane book. Fantastic. And it's great. I read this one a few weeks ago, 
And the second time reading it tonight was just absolutely fantastic. Who is the artist? It's Mike Perkins. Yeah, Mike Perkins. Paul Mounts on the coloring. The artwork is great. It's gritty. It's definitely a crime um, fiction noirish type approach. Of course, Lois Lane is a journalist, so it kind of um, leans away from the superhero -y aspect of it, but it does not lean away from her relationship with Clark Kent slash, of course, Superman. Um, it does it very well, but it gives Lois her own character, her own stance, and Superman is just a supporting character, and I really like it. Greg Ruck is a great writer. He does great dialogue. He really gets the character of Lois Lane. Um, the brief amount of times that he's written her before, not brief, I mean, he did a run on Adventures of Superman, right? He understands the character. He nails it. Perkins nails it. Everybody on this, this book nails it. I'm really, really excited. I've also taken a peek at Jimmy Olsen, number one, by Matt Fraction. Completely different book. And what's really cool is that both of these books have a very unique and different style, and especially from each other and from the Superman books. Lois Lane, number one, though, fantastic. Even if you haven't been digging on Bendis' Superman stuff, if you haven't been keeping up with it, you don't need to. Just read this. It's really good stuff. First issue out of 12. Doom Patrol returns and also the return of DC Young Animal. Weight of the Worlds is the new Doom Patrol series. Issue number one is out. Gerard Way is back, of course. Nick Darrington is back on covers only. That's super, super sad. But James Harvey does some really cool artwork in the inside. Really interesting composition and layouts. Really a, a, a merging of a bunch of different styles. It comes across very psychedelic at times. Also very grounded and weird at other times. Grounded and weird all together. Doom Patrol Way of the Worlds is really, really cool. If you haven't been reading Gerard Way's previous run, you're going to be a little bit confused, but they actually do a really great job um, in a nice quirky way in the story of catching an unfamiliar reader up on who the characters are and all that stuff. So if you just wanted to get into a Doom Patrol comic book because you watched the show and you liked it or something, you totally can check this out, but I would totally recommend that you pick up Brick by Brick first, the first Gerard Way um, trade paperback. Jeremy Lambert joins Gerard Way as a co-writer on this, probably to help keep it on schedule and on time and coming out. And I'm really, really excited for that. But the first issue of this new series takes everything that had been established in the first ones, and now it just runs with it. And it's the Doom Patrol flying through time and space trying to help people. Really good stuff and some great interesting developments on Robot Man, who when last we left him was human. So what is a Robot Man when, he's, when it's human? I don't know. Deceased number three is out this week. Tom Taylor has been doing such a fantastic job. The first issue, I was like, this is nothing but DC's version of Marvel Zombies. And the second issue, you're like, whoa, they got deep, they got nuanced, they made me feel in a story that all these stories matter and all these stories don't matter because they're just stories, but then of course stories are everything, right? But DC's does not set in continuity. So it's one of those stories to some of us, it feels like it maybe doesn't have as much weight as it should, but Tom Taylor and company come in with the full gravity of the situation, especially once again in issue number three. Issue number two is to Batman, what issue number three is to Superman, speaking about what Superman's perspective and experience on the whole zombie outbreak taking over the DC universe, what that would be like. Really cool stuff, great artwork, um, really great story, great pace to it, big, epic, monumental. It feels emotionally monumental. Tom Taylor's Doing some really solid work right now. Deceased number three. Wow. Justice League number 27 is here. James Tynion continuing the story that he started in the last one. This does a lot of explaining again, but also just a lot of setup for what's to come. We're gearing up into the year of the villain. This actually does have the start of those cardstock covers. There's also Deathstroke and Harley Quinn out this week. Um, so they're a dollar more. Let's talk about the cover real quick. It's a dollar more. It's a full face image of whatever the Harley is Harley and the Deathstroke is Deathstroke. The Grod for the Justice League one here. Um, and it's a nice cover. This one's by Art Adams, and it's a really nice cover, and it's nice that it's cardstock, but it's just a dollar more. I don't know. I was expecting it to pop, to be just kind of stand out a little bit more than just the typical variant that they've been doing, aside from the cardstock cover, which is nice, and it'd be cool to have a whole collection of all the faces, right? But for a dollar more, I don't know. I think I might like this cover just a little bit better. The mystery deepens. The story really gets up there. Lots of explaining, lots of setting up. James Tynion and company doing a great job. Snyder, Tynion, and the rest, they have just been crafting this big, epic, giant, multiversal, crisis-type story just in the regular Justice League book. Fantastic stuff. You know it's gearing up to something big. We got Year of the Villain blossoming out right here. Some fun appearances by classic Justice League uh, villains as well, but just really loving Justice League right now. It doesn't stop. Green Lantern number nine, The Green Lantern, by Grant Morrison, Liam Sharp, Steve Olaf, 
Um, the last issue was kind of a step down in quality. This is a step back up. It starts off just a little bit shaky, but by the end of the issue, it all comes to a head. It all comes to an understanding, and it's really cool. And once again, some of the best artwork of Liam Sharp's career, Steve Olaf, Grant Morrison. I've said this before. I'll say it again. These are veterans in the comic book industry, and they're pumping out quality work with the energy of like fresh out of high school or college you know artistic no you know wannabes out there i mean they're just coming at it with fire with so much energy and it shows in every page with the green lantern really cool setup it's interesting at first but it just really cranks it up towards the end this had a nice pace that kind of did that kind of slowly seductively lulled you into the story the artwork the compositions all that stuff is so fun the colors i'm loving it i'm loving it it is not what i expected and one of the things that's the best part about grant morrison to me is that Everybody has their definitive idea of not only who Grant Morrison is and how he writes, but how he would write a particular character, how he would approach a particular run. He always surprises me. Every single time. Superman, Up, Up, and Away, number one, is here. This is a six-issue miniseries, basically collecting those Walmart original stories that Tom King and Andy Cooper did for Superman. There's going to be a Batman and a Wonder Woman coming up soon, too. Um, but this collects the first two chapters of Up, Up, in the Sky, the Tom King, Andy Kubert Walmart exclusive at first, but now here in comic book shops. It's a nice way to format it. There will be a trade paperback afterwards, but having two uh, chapters in each issue and then uh, a trade paperback later, that's a great format for it in case you missed the Walmart books. They were a little bit hard to find. Um, but the story itself is kind of interesting. Um, Tom King's lyrical style of dialogue and just pacing is there, and that's really, really prevalent. Um, there are moments in the second chapter where it gets a little, huh? But then he, he brings it back, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know. First half I liked so much more than the second half, but I'm very intrigued. And I haven't read these, even though I I like aggressively collected like the first five or six issues of each of those DC Walmart specials. I gave up. I just gave up. I was like, man, these are like, I'm paying 20 bucks a month because there were four at the time for mostly books I already have. But anyway, I'm glad this is out. So it's going to be cool to read it all on its own, not distracted by all the uh, other stuff, right? Adventures of the Super Sons, number 12 is here. This is the final issue. Um, bittersweet because it's sad to see this end because now that Jonathan's a little bit older and Damien is still the same age, it's going to have a little bit slightly of a different dynamic. We're never going to have that Peter Tomasi Super Sons again. So it's kind of bittersweet for that, but it's also kind of sweet because it did need to end. 12 issues was kind of long for this one particular story, and that's what it was. It does wrap up the story nice with some really wonderful ideas. Peter Tomasi really understanding his crazy DC metaphysical content. Um, but I do like the ending. I just feel like over the course, I would have preferred this to be maybe like three or four stories that kind of overarched into one big thing. Just one big story just went with it. But it's fun, and it's always going to be nice to look back on these issues of the Adventures of the Super Sons and the initial Super Sons run. And just remember that time when Jonathan Kent and Damian Wayne turned us all into believers. Absolutely. Batman, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, number 3. Um, this has been a wacky crazy Turtles Batman crossover. The other two by Tiny and I really, really like. This one is awesome. It's a great follow-up. It's a great way to, to amp up the energy and, the, and the, the stakes, the plot, everything about it. Um, basically, what's happened is the Batman world and the Turtles world have merged into one. Right? So just think about that. So the Batman origin and the Turtles origin now has become one thing. You see Krang right there in the anti-monitor's body. What? That's right. This is Crisis in a Half Shell and it's awesome. It's a big... If you're a huge Crisis fan um, from DC, you're going to love it, especially if you're a Turtles fan. If you love the previous two series, if you're like me and you are you fit the bill on every single one of those, this is awesome. This is great. Freddie Williams, by the way, assisted by Kevin Eastman in a really clever artistic technique showing the different Raphaels from different worlds. Um, really great artwork, too. Fantastic stuff. Uh, bittersweet. Wildstorm, the Wildstorm, number 24. This is the final issue of Warren Ellis's from the ground up revisioning and reimagining of the Wildstorm universe. Now that it's all said and done, it was splendid, it was masterful, it was elegant, it was absolutely sophisticated, it was deep, it was cutting edge sci fi, it was real, it felt emotionally um, concrete, it felt abstract in ideas and intention, but also just very grounded and just very straightforward. It was great. It was a great action book. It was a great book to make you think. And it was just so much of a treat to have this because growing up a huge, 
I was a huge Wildcats fan growing up. That cartoon, the Jim Lee artwork back in the, night, in the day. I'm like a preteen at this time, you know? It's perfect for me. It was just right there, right? But that stuff has never really been that good. I really do like the Joe Casey stuff that he did in Volume 2 and 3 of Wildcats. So there's always been a piece of me that has a tie to this universe. And of course the Warren Ellis stuff with the Authority and Stormwatch and Planetary already. And when this happened, I was so excited. We knew we were going to get 24 issues. Well, the ticker has arrived at the end. 24 issues and the, the last issue was perfectly perfectly paced, perfectly scripted, perfectly rendered, the line work, the composition, everything about it. Everything comes to one neat little head. At the end of last issue, I was like, how in the hell is Ellis and company going to wrap all of this up in one single issue? Well, they do it, and they do it cool. It does a little bit have a jarring ending, but come on, y'all, it's Warren Ellis. What'd you expect? Really cool stuff, and Wildcats still to come. I want this world to be flourished on other writers come in let's let's do an authority book let's do the, the wildcats book is cool i hear a zealot book may be on the horizon let's do let's do it all let's do it all let's jump over to marvel comics arrow number one so this is one of those new characters that was created and recently showed up in american comics for the first time in the new agents of atlas war of the realms tie-in series um i wasn't really looking that much forward to it i mean i don't really know about much about this character she's got the powers of air so she can make the air move all right i get that so she can fly and she can do all kinds of cool, crazy things with the air. So I read it, and man, it was actually really cool. The artwork is great. The artwork is king. It's written by Zhao uh, Lifin. Um, the adaptations by Greg Pak. I think this is something that maybe... Was it originally published over in Korea or something? I'm not... I can't remember correctly right here. There's also an Arrow and Wave story in the back by Pak and Pop Mon. That, that one's not as good. But man, I really like the artwork. It's big, it's free, it's explosive. The script is sparse and it just has a very highly energetic flow throughout the book. The artwork, the coloring, it really pops and glistens and it's like some of the best visuals you get out of some of the best animes that you watch on a comic book page. So it was actually pretty good. The backup story, not so much, right? Captain America and the Invaders, the Bahamas Triangle. So it's 80th anniversary of Marvel when they started back in the day is timely. So to celebrate 80 years, they've been pumping out all these one shots you know they did an incredible hulk last call they did the wolverine exit wounds this is captain america and the invaders by roy thomas and jerry ordway roy thomas did the invader series in the 70s where he did that retcon type thing where he made it so that submariner human torch toro bucky and of course captain america were all part of one team with others right it was not really what actually happened back in the day that was a retcon right but it was cool cool stuff so roy thomas coming back to do it and jerry ordway on the artwork so it's classic ordway it's classic uh thomas so if you like that stuff and you like it classic, you're going to like Captain America and the Invaders. Absolutely. The Prodigal Son is going to be a story that goes between, what, like Fantastic Four? It's like a special of Fantastic Four, Silver Surfer, and something else. Was it Guardians or something? I don't know. So it's written by Peter David. The first chapter is focusing on the Fantastic Four. I picked it up. I'm a Fantastic Four head. Of course, I'm going to check it out. And it's all right. Peter David doing what Peter David does, but the story itself, the new character that was introduced... Didn't really make me feel like I needed to follow the Fantastic Four into the Silver Surfer book that comes next. So I thought this one was a little bit of a dud. The Magnificent Miss Marvel Annual, number one, is out this week. Um, written by Magdalene Visaggio. Very excited for that one. I love Visaggio's work. She does a great job with here. John Lamb with the artwork does a great job. The coloring um, um, by Ms. Azik or something. Really cool stuff. Very dynamic. A really cool story. Really fun, light, one and done story with a nice little morale at the end. Um, and lots of cool, fun pop culture references. Um, but this is the start of Acts of Evil, which is kind of like a throwback to Acts of Vengeance, but not quite as elaborate or as tied in. But basically pitting up heroes against villains they don't typically go up against. This is Miss Marvel, Kamala Khan versus Super Scroll. Super Scroll is a big Fantastic Four villain. Uh, so I was really excited to check it out. I'm a big Magdalene Visaggio fan. I like Kamala Khan. Um, this was a really fun book. If you've ever wanted to check out Miss Marvel, didn't know where, didn't want to jump in, even at the number one that just came out a few months ago, just read this. Pretty fun stuff. I really liked it. Secret Warps. That whole world where from Infinity Wars where everything got folded. So Captain America and Doctor Strange became Soldier Supreme and Iron Man and Thor became the Iron Hammer. So that world lives in the Soul Stone. Um, and so they're bringing these series of, of annual one shots and they're going to tell like this overall story in that world, right? So if you're interested in more about these characters, then I highly encourage you to check it out. Because the story's not super bad or nothing like that, but it didn't really engage me. It didn't really pull me in, didn't really do too much for me. For, for me, this one... 
which is a little bit of a dud as well. The Immortal Hulk number 20, though, was not a dud. This book does keep getting better. It's just really defining itself. It makes some really cool leaps here. Some really cool correspondences and stuff in here. Just some really cool references in issue number 20. There have been great references to pop culture, um, to metaphysical thought, and just to craziness and to horror, and, and just so much philosophy. And Immortal Hulk is just truly something special. Joe Bennett, the artist doing the best work of his career. Detailed, textured, big, bombastic when it needs to be. Al Ewing. This is my favorite comic book he's ever written. I always thought the Hulk should be approached as a horror comic. And then I wasn't prepared for how truly horrifying this book was going to become. I was just thinking about, you know, the horror of Bruce Banner turning into a monster that, you know, ooh, right? Man, this is getting really horrific and really deep into like some collective unconsciousness like heart of fear and evil type stuff man mortal hulk number 20 is out this week pretty cool stuff punisher number 13 is cool setting up this whole new thing that we're coming about um, where we know that baron zemo is going to be introducing a new team of thunderbolts how does that happen well read this issue to find out it's basically kingpin and zemo trying to work out a deal of how they can stop punisher because now the punisher is back in new york city and after zemo the current leader of hydra because punisher is all about killing him some hydra right now in his next series of course uh, punisher kill crew he's gonna be all about hunting some trolls and stuff like that from the remnants of war of the realms um but anyway this book's been really really fun we know we're building up into the reappearance of Night Thrasher, and I'm very excited about that. Um, but Punisher number 13 is out this week. I did enjoy it. Speaking of Punisher, Cosmic Ghost Rider destroys Marvel history. Number five, the penultimate issue. This one tackles a little bit of Avengers history, but the actual story of Cosmic Ghost Rider in his own past at the time when Punisher's family is about to be killed, that starts taking over more of the story. Starts just getting a little bit repetitive. We're hitting these same points. We're hitting these same themes over and over and over again. Maybe this should have been five issues. This one, the weakest so far, at least for me. Dead Man Logan number nine is out this week. This has been fantastic. Every single issue of Old Man Logan, when Bendis brought him in, when Lemire did his run, when Ed Brisson came in and now into the Dead Man Logan era, I have loved this journey of an old man Logan. He knows he's about to die. He's back in his own world. He's tying up loose ends and he's doing, he just wants to, he's just a cowboy who wants to go walk away into his last sunset, but he wants that sunset to be his choosing. Really loving the stuff that's going on right now in Dead Man Logan. Number nine is out this week. We're nearing the end of that. Also nearing the end of Uncanny X-Men. Uncanny X-Men 21, Matthew Rosenberg, Salvador La Roca and company, they're doing it. Um, it's all right. It comes to a head. Lots of revelations in this issue. You kind of find out what exactly has been going on since Rosenberg took over the title solely. Um, one more issue, and then, of course, Hickman's coming in. Maybe it's because Hickman is right there on the horizon. It's looming, and I feel like it's this book is already in Hickman's shadow, and Hickman's run hasn't started. Maybe it's not fair to judge the book because of that, but to me, it's starting to just feel a little lackluster, especially as we get closer to that big day. Star Wars Target Vader, number one, is a new Vader miniseries, and it seems like Marvel's approach to the Vader book, which they had two semi-ongoing series. They were like 25 issues each. Uh, Karen Gillan, Charles Soule, they were both excellent, both great. Now they're doing like a series of miniseries, and that's kind of what Dark Horse did for a while. Um, Star Wars Target Vader is about a bounty hunter who gets sent to go kill Darth Vader. Yeah, smart move, dude. Pfft, right? The book itself, all right. Kind of flat for me. Another one that was a little flat was Star Wars Age of Resistance Finn. Um, Tom Taylor did write this one, and it does have a decent flow to it. It does have a nice little twist at the end there. Um, but it just didn't have the excitement of some of the ones before, um, especially those Age of Rebellion ones. Man, by Greg Pak, that was some really solid stuff. But I'm excited to see what Taylor and company are going to be doing on these Age of Resistance. Um, but Finn hasn't been the most interesting character to me in the new movies, and this book didn't really help it out too much. But I'm excited to see some of the ones coming out soon. All right, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. If you have managed to avoid all spoilers about what's going on with Walking Dead, I advise you to step away for the video for like 30 seconds to a minute. Good? Let's talk about it. The Walking Dead 193 is here. I haven't been keeping up with it, but I have been keeping up with what's been going on in the book. So I did take a look at this. Issue number 193, this giant 70-page, hugely square-bound, thick one. 
And it's also the final issue. That's right, surprise, the final issue of Walking Dead. Issue 193 is actually a nice wrap-up to the story. It's a very definitive wrap-up to the story. Um, I applaud Kirkman for ending the book this way. I thought this book, would, he would never let it go. I thought he would just, it would be this perpetual cycle of the same, of elements of the same story over and over and over and over again. And he has ended it. And he ended it with false solicitations for upcoming issues. We thought we were building up to issue 200. Um, man, he ended it. This book is done and it's definitive and I hope they don't come back to it. I hope they don't relaunch with a new cast or anything like that. I hope they don't, I hope they don't because this is a really nice definitive ending and this is something we haven't had in comic books in a long time. This is a 15 year story that one dude with the help of a few others has told consecutively throughout for 193 issues and has spawned a major television show out of it and got super rich, I'm sure. So applause to Robert Kirkman and for ending it the way you did because that's ballsy and I don't think anybody else would do it. But man, but the ending itself, man, a little cliche, but pretty cool. Nice wrap up there. Sea of Stars, number one, is a new one from Image Comics. We've been gearing up for this one. Jason Aaron, Dennis Hallam, co-writing this one together. Stephen Green, Rico Renzi on the artwork. Rico's colors, wow. They are masterful. Look at that first page right there. Beautiful, luscious, textured colors. Great line work by Green. I love the art. This is basically the story of a space trucker who has to make an emergency run from Earth to another place in the galaxy somewhere, right? And he doesn't have anybody to watch his kid, so he takes his kid. They wind up getting separated, and they're separated by a lot of space. Imaginative, cute, fun, energetic, um, really engaging, a great pace throughout. And like I said, the art, the composition, the texture of that coloring, the color choices, the palette, everything is absolutely pitch perfect about Sea of Stars number one. A fantastic debut from Image Comics. Another one out from Image Comics, Space Bandits number one. This is from Mark Miller and artist Matteo Scalera, artist over at Black Science. One of my homie, Robbie from Earth 2's favorite artist. He got to meet him at Heroes Con. Super cool dude. Did him a really nice Conan on his Savage Avengers blank cover. Space Bandits, number one though, a great debut issue. Think of it as basically Thelma and Louise in crazy bonkers space. That's exactly what it is. One of my criticisms, but one of the things also that's kind of what Mark Miller does is that he just takes like a popular tropey movie or something like that, or like a popular movie or a popular idea, and he just merges it with a different genre or something. Like what if it was big meets superhero? She gets superior, right? Right, just a little bit, right? So this is like Thelma and Louise in space, but the first issue was great, the art was great, the coloring was actually really cool. Marcelo Maiolo, and I'm not sure if he's colored him before, I don't, I don't know who colors Scalera on Black Science, but the coloring was not quite what I thought it would be, but I would tell you, like, look at that striking difference in color right there and the way it pops, the coloring, the line work really carry this book through. It's a neat little idea, decent characters that are set up. Really excited to see what's gonna happen. Um, but we'll see, because sometimes Mark Miller books fizzle out for me. But I'm more excited for Space Bandits than I have been for one in a minute. Well, Prodigy. Prodigy lost me at the end there. Prodigy started off really good too. Crowded is back, Crowded number seven. So Christopher Sabella, the writer of Test, my pick of the week from Vault Comics. This is the first issue of the second arc of Crowded, his book, from Image Comics with artwork by Rose Stein, um, Ted Brandt, colors by Triano Farrell, and a whole bunch of other people on there. They're all in the credits and it's great. The design, the look, the feel of this book, it's great. Crowded is about um, this random person and she gets, the, so take about like the way that all of our apps are right now and crowdfunding and stuff like that. So there's this, this app called Reaper where you can, you can basically put a hit out on someone and people can bid on it and add money to it and make that hit price go up. This woman has a major Reaper account on her now, and now she's got a bodyguard trying to defend her. The first story arc was great. It's it's scintillating, it's filled with energy, it's fast, it's got a lot of dense, line, uh, dense artwork in there, a lot of dense dialogue and narration. Really great story, but they just put so much in there, but it never feels like it's overloaded or it's too heavy or it's verbose or anything like that. It really has a nice flow to it. It's highly kinetic, great artwork, great coloring. And like I said, the flow of this, it pops, it snaps, and it crackles. And I know I said that wrong, but because it's not serial, it's a comic book. Crowded returns with issue number seven, the start of the second arc. 
get into it if you haven't already. Also from Image, Thumbs number two is out. This issue is great. I love the first one. It's basically like, what if some kind of crazy billionaire decided that he was going to help underprivileged kids and like hook them up with like an AI babysitter when their parents were out slaving away to make ends meet or because they didn't care. And he also gave them like free video games, but in actuality, he's training them to be this army where he can take over the United States government. Bam, there you go. That's what Thumbs is about. This is really, really cool. The title character Thumbs is just a kid in this system trying to make his way through. And it's real fun stuff, great characters, but Hayden Sherman's artwork, this is written by Sean Lewis with artwork by Hayden Sherman. It's got great ideas in it, but look at the artwork. Oh my goodness, it's big, it's, it's expansive compared to some of his work in like Wasted Space, for instance. The artwork gets more expansive, it gets more spacious, it builds it out. There's lots of double page spreads, lots of awesome stuff. Lots of great show of motion and movement in the book. Really great layouts, really effective coloring. Thumbs number two, two out of five. Man, loved it. And for $4.99, the same price as the DC cardstock covers. It's got a nice gloss and shine to it, a striking cover. Really nice shine on it. I'd go with that, I'd go with that. Section Zero is here with issue number four. This is the first new issue. Section Zero, of course, was created by Carl Kiesel and Tom Grummet back in like 2000 for Guerrilla Comics. They did three issues and it disappeared. They kickstarted it back into production. I picked up the trade paper or the hardcover from them, so I'm gonna actually just sit down one day and read that whole thing. They already have worked on a uh, prequel, Section Zero, 1959. It's like, <clears throat> excuse me, it's kind of like a Jack Kirby influenced X-Files if that makes sense. Section Zero though, number four is out with the first original new content where the story jumps ahead 18 years. I did flip through it. I've already flipped through the whole book. I'm excited to read it because I've been a fan of these guys for a long time. Man Eaters is out this week with issue number 10, which I swear I thought was the final issue. But no, it's not. The story's gearing up, but it's starting to lose me a little bit. <clears throat> I know this book has faced some criticism of late, and I think in this book it tries to address it in a more appropriate way than it did in previous issues, and I do applaud it a little bit for that, though at times it just feels like it's kind of forced in and maybe it's not. I don't know. I'm not, I have really no comment on any of that stuff. But Man Eaters, as the story, is starting to feel a little incoherent, starting to get a little incohesive, like it's starting to come unglued. Maybe it's the behind the scenes stuff, maybe it's just affecting what's going on in the book, but it's starting to feel a little bit frantic and a little bit rushed. And it sucks because this is something I really, really liked. And this still has some really hard-hitting moments. But it's got a lot of wonky moments in it, too. It does. No One Left to Fight, number one, though, from Dark Horse Comics this week, has no wonky moments. This book is awesome. It says on the front, the comic you always wanted. I second that. You don't even know. This book is awesome. If you're a big fan of, like, Dragon Ball Z or, like, fighting games like Yu-Gi-Oh! or Street Fighter or anything like that, especially if you're a fan of Dragon Ball Z, get into this book. Imagine like Goku and Vegeta and they finally defeat the biggest evil they're ever going to defeat and now years later and Goku has never gotten it together and Vegeta has it made, has the woman of his dreams, has a family and Goku comes back and he's like, hey man, and, you, and, he, and you, he's making you jealous and he just wants to relive his past and you're ah, really good stuff. Great artwork, really beautiful coloring, uh, really imaginative. So it's, it's set, it's a fantasy sci-fi type thing. Um, really, really, this is seriously, if you like Dragon Ball Z, if you ever liked anything high energy like that, man, check out No One Left to Fight this week. That book's top five material. Black Hammer Age of Doom number 11 is here. Um, Age of Doom's really getting pretty crazy. Lots of explanation in this one. Really loving Black Hammer. Jeff Lemire's just doing a great job with this one, especially with Dean Ormston on the artwork. Really hitting all those sentimental moments we need to, all the right moments, the moments of wonder, bringing us back to things that have been mentioned that maybe we forgot about just to bring it back at the right time, the right pacing. He has a sense of being able to know when to reintroduce elements to the story to keep it flowing because this is a book that started out based on a very simple mystery. That mystery has since been solved and it keeps getting intriguing, high stakes, and the repercussions. Who knows? Black Hammer Age of Doom number 11 out this week. Also, the world of Black Hammer and Encyclopedia. So think of this as like it's like a who's who type thing, you know, like an official handbook guide to all the different characters from all the different timelines of Black Hammer. It even has this really nice nifty timeline right there in the very beginning. This is not necessarily essential to the Black Hammer fan, but I would highly recommend that you get it. I think you'll get some new information out of there and also some teases as to what's to come 
and maybe the first tease of some of the next miniseries. Really interesting though, and it kind of helps it all tie together into one cohesive thing, which it actually does. <clears throat> Excuse me. From Action Lab Entertainment, Danger Zone. We got Spencer and Locke 2, number 4. This is the final issue of the second volume of Spencer and Locke. Think Calvin and Hobbes meets Sin City. What if Calvin grew up to be a hard-boiled detective fighting the, the on the tough streets, fighting crime and murder and all that kind of stuff, and his partner is Hobbes, grown up, and he still he still carries around a stuffed animal, and there you go, right? But it's it's cute, it's charming, it's funny, it's wonky, it's weird, it's wild, but it's also deep and nuanced and rich. David Popo's Jorge Sant uh, Santiago Jr. Um, and company, fantastic work. The finale, slam bang. I'll be doing a special video in the next few weeks about the entire series. Ignited number two is here from Humanoids, H1. Um, so this one, Ignited number two, was really good. And I really liked issue number one. The idea of this is that uh, victims of the school shooting, some of them start developing powers. And now they're going to use these powers to make the world hear their voice and what they have to say. Um, the tensions they're building up in issue number two, it approaches social, uh, socio-political ideas and, and social commentary in a way that doesn't feel preachy or forced or, or imbalanced. Um, it has great dialogue, it's got a great sense of character, it's got a great sense of artistic flow and composition. Ignited number two was a, a treat. I absolutely loved it. So check it out. Co-written by Mark Wade and also Kwanzaa also, Yefo, I probably messed it up, with artwork by Phil Brionis, Andrew Crossley on the colors, and a larger world studios on the lettering. But they're building up a whole new world here. Um, and I'm really digging what they're doing at Humanoids right there. At Catalyst Prime, we've got Kino. Kino? Kino, I think it's Kino. Number 17 out, which is the third part of the fourth story overall of this, the fourth part, or the third part of Alex Pockendale's second story. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat's getting dry. Um, Kino's doing a great job of taking some, also some social commentary and making it into such a way where it's obvious, but it still tells a great story. Doing a great job with this one. Really like the setup. I'm starting to feel a little lost at times when I'm reading this, so I definitely need to go back and, uh, and reread some things. But one of my favorite things about this book and the way Alex Pactendell's been approaching it is that he respects what Joe Casey did in the issues before, but he really has been going full force into his own style, into his own direction, and I'm loving it. And I'm loving um, the volumes that he's speaking in the pages of Kino right now. And finally, let's talk about Buffy the Vampire Slayer, issue number six. Um, what started out to me to be a very rushed, putting in too much, too many ingredients into the pot type thing to start off a reboot of Buffy in 2019 um, has turned into a really fun book that still has these these fluid mercurial relationships they haven't quite firmly um cemented yet right that's still there that effect of that feeling of how it's just too much too soon has totally evened out and leveled out for me they're building up the big Hellmouth event that they just announced a crossover between angel and buffy probably their first meeting in this new continuity um but i'm really liking it really liking it and taking some familiar concepts and reimagining them reinventing them uh, making them age a little bit better in certain times, and then taking severely underutilized characters and really putting them in in a moment early to shine more brightly than it, they ever did on the TV show. Here's looking at you, Robin. Anyway, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, number six, out this week. So that's what I read. That's what I thought about it. What you read and what you think about it, let me know in the comments down below. Please do subscribe if you haven't already, and like and share, and click that notification bell as well. We really do appreciate all the, all the support. Thank you so much. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups. Thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.